with Victor Sheed. This is Victor Sheed. It is Wednesday, May 17th. There is so much happening in the news right now. And as someone who is in politics, and as I'm sure all of you can relate to just by reading all of the news, it is exhausting. It is draining. But one of the ways we can get through these difficult times is through comedy and humor. And that is something that my guest today is very, very good at. He is John Fugel saying who really needs no introduction. He's a comedian. He's the host of Sirius XM uh, show, which I've been honored to be a part of a couple of times. And he's just uh, a funny and decent human being. John, it is so great to see you. Thank you for being with me this morning. Thank you, Victor. It's a pleasure to drag your show down to my level. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's a level I would love to be at. But um, there's so much to talk about. Um, but I want to start with George Santos. I know you're in New York, and I want to get your thoughts on the fact that he's been charged with more than a dozen counts of wrongdoing. And yes. look at someone like George Santos. I mean, what does that tell you about the Republican Party and how much it's sunk in? Look, it tells me a lot. It tells me about the Republican Party and their standards. It tells me about the quality of the Democratic Party's opposition research. It tells me a lot about the quality of most local and state and national journalists that they let this guy slip through. Yeah. And it tells me a little bit about the low standards of voters on Long Island, where I was born, but I already knew quite a bit about that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I kind of feel like we need to get off George Santos's case. Yes, he lied about everything. Yes, he stole from a disabled vet with a dying dog. Yes, he's such an empty shell. Hermit crabs could live inside of him. But he look at how corrupt he is, uh, how he steals from people, how he pretends to be a religion that he doesn't belong to, how he even exploited 9-11 for crass political points. Victor, he's the most Republican Republican we've got. He yeah. should be running the entire party right now. He embodies everything that they've come to be known for. He is a symptom, not a problem, of where this party has gone. And I mean, are you optimistic that you mentioned voters in Long Island? Are you optimistic that people in Long Island are going to kind of realize this and, and vote for someone not George Santos in 2024? Oh, I know absolutely. there are some people yeah. Biden, running already. Biden, you, you got it. Joe Biden won that district by uh, over 10 points. Yeah. So clearly this was a bit of an anomaly. Uh, and again, look, don't get me wrong. George, George Santos, a, a, a gay immigrant for Trump, is proof that God loves us and wants us to laugh, Victor. So I support a lot of this. But at the end of the day, I, I don't think he's going to be leaving. Kevin McCarthy needs his vote. Yeah, his yeah. job is as safe as a band leader who laughs at Jay Leno's jokes. I think what we need to do is accept that he's going to be in Congress for another year and a half. And we need to pick him up by the ankles and beat Kevin McCarthy with him every day because that they own him. They have to own him. Absolutely. Well, let's take a trip uh, down to Florida with some other insane Republicans, Ron DeSantis, who is insane, but he's also seen as competent. Um, and up until yesterday, I was a little bit skeptical, I have to say, about how much people there um, are waking up. But voters in Jacksonville nominated the first woman mayor and Democrat uh, for a long time. And I, I feel slightly better. I'm wondering how you feel about Florida and, and kind of what's going on in that state. Is Are things changing after last night? Look, I love Florida, okay? I've spent a lot of time there. I have two parents who are buried there who I love very much. Florida is a, a great... I love any place where people move for the climate, Victor, and then they stay in their cars all day with their air conditioning to avoid the climate or their home. <laughs> I, I, I love a society where seniors can drive on the highway and leave that turn signal on because the clicking sound keeps them awake. I love Florida. Um, but this is, this is modern Florida. This is Ron DeSantis, the boy who cried woke, who just got crushed by a mouse. Uh, look, I think there's still a very good chance DeSantis could be our next president. There's a very good chance he could be the nominee. He's much more electable than Trump is. Yeah. And at this point, he's not even officially running yet while he has a super PAC that's out there doing Democratic opposition research against Donald Trump. I mean, the best selection of distilling the lies of Trump's CNN town enabling was done by DeSantis' super PAC. And the guy's not even running. So we have to remember, DeSantis and Trump hate each other so much, they could both sing lead for the Eagles. Let's just yeah. sit back and enjoy and smell the train wreck as these two tear each other apart. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, DeSantis won't be able to pull it out because I'm a fan of history. And Donald Trump has a really good chance, Victor, of becoming the first man ever to lose the American popular vote three times. Yeah. And only he can do it. <laughs> well, that would be glorious. Um, I, but I'm, I want to go back to Ron DeSantis because, I mean, what's happening in Florida is so 
pernicious and so just terrible for the state. You have, I mean, the other day he banned uh, DEI programs at all public colleges and universities. He's attacking teachers. He's attacking students. He's going after basically everything that kind of we care and, and our fundamental rights. What do you think Ron DeSantis is trying to get with all of this? I mean, what's his end goal, if you can even kind of see that? His end goal is to be president. And Ron DeSantis is a revoltingly fake Christian. Let me say that again. A revoltingly yeah. fake right wing Christian nationalist who rejects the teachings of Christ and does the opposite of what Jesus says because yeah. he believes, and maybe he's right, that right wing Christianity will reward you for being as unchristian as possible. The cruelty yeah. isn't always the point. Sometimes the cruelty is the audition. And Ron DeSantis is taking these Christian refugees, which is what they were. They're not illegals. They were migrants. Seek they were migrants and asylum seekers, Christian refugees, lying them onto a plane to have this cheap theatrical stunt and dump them off on the Republican mayor of Massachusetts. It's all performative meanness. That's what yeah. Don't Say Gay yeah. is. That's what Stop Woke is. Stop Woke is all about, hey, if we teach racism, the children of racists might feel bad about something. And it's, again, Democrats can go after this if they just say, hey, Let's talk about what Jesus actually says in the Bible, but they yeah. don't heed this ground for the right wing. And that allows demagogues like Ron DeSantis in a state that has three different holidays celebrating the Confederacy, three different state holidays celebrating white supremacy Confederacy, but no holiday celebrating the end of slavery on Juneteenth. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you and I, we talk a lot about um, what Democrats can be doing better. You mentioned how Democrats might be able to respond better to Republicans. But in this kind of battle, when you have, so, I mean, Republicans making truly uh, just absurd arguments through, with like meaningless words. I mean, CRT, critical, um, critical race theory, DEI, wokeness. I mean, these are all words that have like little meaning, but they're able to weaponize these words. How should Democrats be responding to them in this moment? Are we going hard enough? Call BS where BS is. You know, wh yeah. why do you think they're talking about critical race theory? Why do you think they're talking about uh, Hunter Biden's laptop? I mean, they have yeah. nothing to offer hardworking conservative people. They have nothing to offer you in terms of making your health care more affordable. Nothing to offer you in terms of making college more affordable or getting your college loans off your back. Yeah. They have nothing to offer non-millionaires. So they're going to do all distractions all the time. And debating, this is called the gish gallop. Yes. where you overwhelm your opponent with so much bullshit, they're answering lie number two when you're on lie number 16. Mitt right. Romney was brilliantly against Obama in their first debate in Denver in 2012. And, and that's what all this is. They're flooding the zone with outrage and angertainment. And we have to take the time to try to correct it, but we also have to realize... Some people enjoy being lied to. Don't people don't want to hear that critical race theory actually is a is a good thing that's only taught in law school and not taught in public schools. We spend all this time, Victor, deconstructing the lies. And while we do it, they spread more. At the end of the day, we got to talk about the facts, which is critical race theory has no bearing on your life, on yeah. your retirement, on your student loan payments. What are we actually fighting for here and who's got policies to help pull the middle class up more than the other guy? I couldn't agree more. And um, I'm wondering, you know, now I mentioned at the beginning of the episode kind of the role that humor and comedy has in all of this. And um, when you're talking to kind of people on the other side and just in voters, Republicans who may lean that way, how do you talk to them now? And how can people like me or people who don't consider themselves to be humorous use comedy to our advantage when engaging with other side? Well, B Billy Wilder uh, said my favorite quote that I, I lean on every day, which was, if you're going to tell people the truth, make it funny or they'll kill you hmm. and you get a lot farther in this yeah. society i've learned with the truth and a dick joke than with just the truth so obviously humor is important uh john lennon famously said when you're dealing with fascism nonviolence and humor are the only two things fascists can't handle so it's always yeah. important but we also have to remember don't punch down like i i, I try in all my humor not to take on hardworking conservative people. I go after the ones in power who are lying to them and manipulating their fears. I, I, I do believe we have to go after meanness, but in general, I think the rule of good comedy is don't punch down. You know, you ever go to a comedy club and you see some hack making jokes about the homeless or developmentally disabled people, special Olympics jokes, et cetera, they might get a few laughs, but you feel dirty afterwards because it's punching it down at someone weaker than you. Yeah. This is Republican politics. This is Republican Christianity. Let's crap on the marginalized. 
it's not good for government. It's not good for capitalism. It's really not good Christianity. It's bad for comedy. You got to hit at those in power. Donald Trump is a millionaire at birth with a gold toilet who cut his own taxi. <laughs> it's easier to make fun of him than the poor schlub yeah. that's in the cult of obedience. Yeah, absolutely. The last topic I want to talk to you about um, is the debt ceiling and default. Um, it seems like there might be hope that negotiations are getting somewhere. But how do you see this playing out? Will Republicans actually come to their senses and realize the fact that they increase the debt ceiling three times under Trump, but aren't willing to do so now because of politics? Oh, the number to remember, my friend, is 1873. Mm. 1873. 18, the number of times they raised the debt ceiling for Reagan. Seven, the number of times they raised it for Bush. And three, the number of times they raised it yeah. for Trump. But under Obama, under Joe Biden, now there's a problem. Um, it's depressing. It's lame. Let's be honest. Both sides are milking this thing so hard. My nipples hurt. Uh, at the end of the day, Kevin McCarthy's in a very difficult place because he's held hostage by the Marjorie Taylor Greens of his party. And because he is dumb, desperate, yeah. And uh, he, well, he, he's dumb and desperate. Uh, so that's why he allowed this rule that one member can call for a vote to throw out the speaker. It used to be a majority of either party had to call for a vote. If a majority wanted a vote to throw out a speaker, they could do it. Now, one little Matt Gates can do it anytime he wants. So Joe Biden could put this thing to bed. He's going to take it to the very end. But Joe Biden could use the 14th Amendment. It gives him the right. Joe Biden could also really, really could just mint that $1 trillion coin and bring it over to the Treasury. He could do it himself and boom, we're done. I think Joe Biden should mint the $1 trillion coin and hold it up and end every speech by saying, I don't want to use this, but you bitches might make me, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, but here's the thing. The Politico had a great story about this leak that the Democrats in the center have already cut a deal with McCarthy, that if he just goes ahead and raises the debt ceiling and if the fund if the fascists in his own party try to kill him as speaker, there are enough Democrats who will vote to protect his job as speaker as a quid pro quo for raising the debt ceiling. That to me sounds like the ultimate fail safe. Yeah, yeah. It'd be kind of hilarious just to see how angry it would make Matt Gates. I mean, how do you feel like the American people are perceiving this um, in in that way, though? Like, are are people perceiving this as pres as Republicans are failing to do their job, and and President Biden is doing the best uh, to negotiate, or are they blaming President Biden? If if that's the case, how do we change that perception? You know how it is, Victor. One third think it's all Biden's fault. One yep. third think Biden's doing a fine job, and one third don't care. That's how it always is in America. It's always one third right wing, one third somewhat progressive, one third apathy. So, you know, most Americans ignore this. They don't really pay attention to it. It's not like a government yeah. shutdown yet where, you know, your your checks won't come if you're uh, in the military. Um, this is going to be the sort of thing that is uh, the media class and folks like you and me pay a lot of attention to. And yeah. for most people, it's going to, you know, it's going to be like a sporting event they know exists and they hear about it on TV, but they don't follow it too closely. It's yeah. very scary. But at the end of the day, Joe Biden has two methods at his disposal to prevent a default. So we can all calm down and appreciate the theater for what it is, the yeah. theater on both sides. Well, I think that's the perfect way to end this. John Fugelson, thank you so much for joining me this morning and, and giving us a little bit of laughter this morning and when, when there's so much going very on. Very little, I promise. Very <laughs> extremely little. Very... My, my shows are tragic. It's, 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 like a big Mark, it's like a big Mark Bergman did stand up. That's how little comedy there is. Victor, you're a gentleman. I love having you on our show. We're on Sirius XM five yes. nights a week. And you can always hear the John People Sang podcast wherever you get your pods. John, thank you so much. Great seeing you. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. You too. Well, that was an awesome episode with John Fugel saying, um, and uh, he always is able to kind of put politics into a comedic perspective. So thank you, John, for joining me this morning. Um, there are a couple of things I want to get to. I mentioned one at the top of this episode. Um, first is uh, I mentioned uh, Jacksonville, Florida. Basically, uh, yesterday there was a special election in Jacksonville uh, for their mayoral election, and uh, they have now elected a first woman uh, to serve as the mayor of Jacksonville beating this Republican who ran against her, who trafficked in lies, just typical Republican ideology. And it's a really significant moment because over the past 30 years, Democrats have only won during four years of those. So they've held control 
four years out of the past 30 years. And so this is a pretty significant race. She, uh, the Republican incumbent is now, now, is now no longer the Republican incumbent. Uh, Donna Deeks, she is uh, the new mayor of Jacksonville, Florida. And that's a big deal. Uh, don't let anyone tell you it's not because this is a Republican stronghold in a DeSantis area. And um, I really think this is starting to be the change for Florida. I mean, she's really able to, she was really able to yesterday um, persuade a lot of people to vote for her. Turnout was pretty high. And I think people in Florida are pissed off at what's happening there. I mean, it's it's just another one of those states that people, that Ron DeSantis keeps on messing with their lives and they have now turned out to the ballot box. And I think this is a pretty strong precedent for what's to come in 2024. I think for Democrats, there should be good news in this. Of course, it's not signs that we should give up quite yet. We have to still keep fighting, turn out every single voter out there, but uh, I really, I really think this is, is good news for Democrats, and we should take comfort in this. Um, a couple of other things um, uh, in North Carolina, the. Republican state legislature has um, overridden a veto by the governor that would have banned uh, their 12-week abortion ban. So basically now that means that North Carolina is the latest state to pass a restrictive abortion ban uh, that would uh, enact, that would go into effect at 12 weeks. Um, it's again, draconian. This is the latest Republican state that is now doing this. And um, I tweeted this last night, but these Republican states just don't seem to be learning from their past mistakes. I mean, you saw what happened in 2022. You have states like Michigan, uh, Nevada, California, where you have abortion rights on the ballot and people are ginned up. They're they are voting for that and they're rejecting what Republicans are trying to do. You saw this in Wisconsin as well and across the country in Kansas and throughout the country. And it's just this continued effort by Republicans to make it harder for women to live their lives. Young people are paying attention. Women are paying attention. And they're unleashing two of the most important demographics, demographics for elections now, women and young people. And I, I think they are going to uh, pay the price in 2024. North Carolina might have just flipped blue last night after what happened. And so uh, for all the Republicans down there, I would be pretty scared um, because I, I don't think women or young people are going to take this very receptively. Um, but right now, I think you're seeing some fascinating things across the country. Country. You're seeing Republicans, I think, being defeated. We saw that in Wisconsin. You saw that again yesterday in Florida, as well as Colorado. Pennsylvania had a special election. They have now uh, maintained their uh, supermajority in the Senate and the House, or the majority in the Senate and the House. So Pennsylvania is blue in all three chambers and the House and the Senate and also the governorship. You saw um, yesterday North Carolina. Uh, I think that spells doom for Republicans there. So all around, I think you're seeing some bad news for Republicans and some good news for Democrats because. Voters, I think, at the end of the day, just want normalcy. They want their lives. They want their rights uh, to be protected. And uh, they don't want this craziness from the Republican Party. And so I think voters can see right through it. And so my message for you on this Wednesday is there's a lot to be hopeful for. But that means that we should also continue to be in the fight. All of us watching here today should not stop here. We have to keep on staying in the fight and pushing and fighting for what's important. Um, volunteer in a campaign. Donate to a local organization. Do anything. Those things matter. Um, just a quick programming note tomorrow. I will not be here, but I will be back on Friday uh, to talk about Fox News with uh, decoding Fox News on Twitter. You don't want to miss that. Uh, she is great. She's going to join me to talk about Fox, how it manipulates their audience and how the left can better respond to Fox. So don't miss that. It'll be at 11 a.m. Eastern time, 8 a.m. Pacific right here on YouTube.com slash Politicon. Don't miss it. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Thank you all for watching today and I will see you all on Friday.